Hey everybody, today I'm going to be talking about my top 10 favorite film scores and obviously this is just the first five and I'll cover the other five at another point in another video. Musical scores have always played a big part of why I love movies so much and you know if you know anything about me you know that I come from a very very musical family. Music has always been a part of my life so I feel like I have a very strong connection to it and a strong connection to a lot of scores out there. These are just kind of in a random order so I'm just gonna get started with my first one which is The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly and that was composed by Ennio Morricone. I feel like it's a law to include a work by Ennio Morricone in a top scores list just because he is an incredible composer, an incredible musician. There's nobody that sounds like him or even close. He really developed his own style and it's he's one of those people that even if you know nothing about film scores, you, you listen to one of his melodies from one of his films and, and you know immediately that's Ennio Morricone. Sergio Leone, who was somebody that um, Ennio Morricone collaborated with often. A lot of people look at him as this great innovator for westerns in the 1960s by, you know, creating this the Italian spaghetti western. And he is certainly, but I think that almost equal credit credit should go to Ennio Morricone as well. He did so many different scores and I know it's probably a cliche choice, but I have to pick the good, the bad and the ugly as my favorite one that he did. And as great a film as it is, I think that the music just elevates it to a much higher level. Like the film itself is very, very good, but it's that score that makes it masterful, what makes it great. And it's just one of those scores, like you hear that whistle at the very beginning of the, of the score, of the soundtrack. It's obviously a tune that has become synonymous with not just spaghetti westerns, but just westerns in general. Even though that is a very famous part of the music, I think there's a lot in the score if you listen to the entire soundtrack. The score has very intricate sounds, very distinct textures, throughout that gives it a really kind of authentic feel and, and, and backdrop for the film. Yet it still has that very vast, grand, sweeping feel to it. That is, of course, what makes a Western. And I think this is very evident in like the track at the end of the film, The Ecstasy of Gold, which is, I think, just a masterpiece. It's a different type of music and sound for Westerns that had never been matched and as far as I'm concerned it, it never was matched. Next I'm going to pick a film called Kayana Satsuki from the 80s and the music is composed by Philip Glass. And this might be a cheat because the film, some people don't even consider it an actual film. Some call it a documentary and, you know, because there isn't really any dialogue or anything like that. And there are no characters, there's no story. Some people just might as well just call it a, a really long montage. But that's the idea of it, is to give the viewer a very meditative, very sensory experience. And the film starts kind of, it shows the world at the very beginning of time and how the evolution of mankind has slowly evolved and created this very industrial urban culture. And I feel like Philip Glass was born to write music for a film like this. I think it's one of his best works that he ever did. And it's like, almost like, you know, when he was born, it was like, one day he will write the score for Kiana Satsuki. Like Morricone, he has a very distinct style that has been emulated over and over and over again. Um, but, you know, he's a minimal, minimalist composer, and he is known for having this very kind of cold, almost like mechanical, very repetitive feel to his music. But he has the ability to create these very haunting, very evocative chord progressions. And that's precisely why this works for Kiana Satsuki, is because the music is such an integral part of how the film moves, because again, there's no sound or anything really, uh, it's just the images and, and the music. And it's meant to feel very detached, very alienating, because that's the way society has progressed over the years. We've become more and more alienated from each other. And technology really is the springboard for that alienation, which is why that kind of mechanical, repetitive feel of uh, Philip Glass's music works. Some people find his music to be too repetitive, but I don't see that. I think that's the point of minimalism. Uh, and I think why the rep repetition works so well is because there's that pulsing tension beneath it that just builds and builds throughout. And it's just brilliant. I, I love it and I, I love this film. Next I'm going with La Strada, which is composed by Nina Rota. And I could list so many amazing scores that Nina Rota composed for Fellini films like La Strada, but also like Amar Kord, Knights of Kiberia, Eight and a Half, La Dolce Vita, the list goes on and on and on. They were just 
the perfect collaborative team. And I can't imagine anyone else being the one to create the music for Fellini's films because Fellini is so quirky. He's so unlike anyone else in terms of the way that he um, conveys his ideas. Fellini is very known for um, capturing the feel, like symbolism of like circus, circus performance, art imagery uh, with humor, and then he contrasts that with a lot of depth and a lot of loneliness. So even though it's very stylized, there's so much underneath it, and I feel like La Strada is probably one of the most heartbreaking films that he made, and also one of the more heartbreaking scores, because it, it does capture the broken relationship between two people. And this is a far more subtle, more kind of stripped down film for Fellini compared to films that he did later, like Eight and a Half and Julia the Spirits. It does have those early influences and hints of what Fellini would later become. And Nina Rota brings that out, I think, maybe, and maybe in some ways, I think Fellini was kind of inspired by the music because in this film, he creates that perfect contrast. Again, Rota's music, it's got a very robust, very Italian carnival feel to it, and it's a very rousing piece of music, the, the opening overture. I think the best part of the score is that very famous, very lonely trumpet melody. It's, it's very beautiful and, and very sad, and it's an integral part of the film. It's, it's diegetic. But that's what I mean. It's got everything. I think it's got the spectacle, and yet it's very painful to listen to because it's got a lot of um, depth and, and almost subtlety. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's the best word to use, but I just mean that it really gets to the heart of your emotions. And next I'm going to go with The Man with the Golden Arm, and the music for this was composed by Elmer Bernstein. This movie came out in the 1950s and it was starring Frank Sinatra back when he was really trying to prove that he was deserving of winning the Oscar back in, I guess, 1951. He wanted to prove that he was a serious actor. So he took on a very serious role with a, in a film that had very serious themes. It's a solid movie. It's, it's not great, I would say. It's entertaining, but I have to give props to the director, Otto Preminger, and, and Sinatra for really being ballsy. They weren't afraid to lift the velvet curtain, so to speak, and show a very dark, very gritty side of, of the world that deals with a lot of, of corruption, a lot of drug abuse. Sinatra gave an, a really, really good performance, a very uh, vulnerable performance, and he, he plays an ex-drug addict that comes back into town and is slowly pulled down into this spiral of addiction and corruption yet again. And I love how the score captures it. But for me, the score is just, it's, it's one of those scores that is head and shoulders above the film itself. I mean, it, it leaves the film in the dust. That's how good it is. It's a very bombastic, very harsh, jazzy kind of soundtrack. It's, it's intentional that it's meant to kind of stand out from the rest of the film, and it does create that chaos. It reflects all of those very seedy surroundings and that conflict within Sinatra's character himself, you know, he's constantly kind of going back and forth between temptation and sobriety. But honestly, there are so many amazing parts of the soundtrack. And Elmer Bernstein was such a great composer, and I think this is one of his best. And I just love really great jazz scores to begin with. But, I mean, you just look up the soundtrack and listen to the main title for the film, and if you're not amazed by it, then, you know, you're beyond help. <laughs> and the last score that I'm going to talk about in this particular video for part one is The Third Man, and the score was written by Anton Karas. I originally saw this film the first time when I was like, I don't know, 17, 18 years old, and I remember hating, originally, hating the score to it. I thought it was just so annoying, I couldn't wait for it to end. But I'm just gonna use the excuse that I was young and naive and didn't know what was good. The older I got and the more it started to grow on me, I realized I can't imagine another score accompanying this film at all. It's a very unusual film in that it's made like as a classic film noir in terms of the structure of it, but it has a lot of very off-kilter elements, and that's literal because so much of the film is shot in canted angles. But it's full of, you know, very dark characters but that have very duplicitous motivations. And I think that using that very sharp zither sound as the instrument for the score is what gives it that off-kilter quality, but it also has the irony because it's very jaunty and very kind of seemingly positive. It's got a very kind of upbeat feel to it. To me, what holds the film together, of course, is the inclusion of, of the great Harry Lyme, the villain played by the always charismatic Orson Welles. The entire score is the embodiment of the character in that way because with his character, you never, ever know what he's up to. He's a very 
intimidating, very mysterious character, yet he's so charming. Like, he can threaten you one moment and then just kind of brush it off with some witty remark. He's always kind of lurking in the shadows, he's always on, on people's minds, and he's always one step ahead of everyone else. And the score has that very cheeky, very smug, quirky feel to it, and that's what's so creative about it, because they could have gone with a very traditional kind of orchestral score, but adding that just kind of jaunty zither music is just brilliant. It, it's something you just wouldn't expect, and I absolutely love it. And that is part one. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, the link is below, and you can also like my Facebook page in the link below that. Part two coming soon.